Remember last week when Donald Trump said he wanted comprehensive gun reform? Neither do I. As the days since have featured anything but, with Trump hosting NRA meetings at the White House, and today a summit not on gun issues, but rather violent video games, or as some of the attendees call them, murder simulators. Because that's the problem? Yesterday, in response to the Parkland shooting, lawmakers in Florida, called by one anchor the Petri dish of the NRA, approved a bill that would raise the minimum age to buy a gun from 18 to 21, require a three-day waiting period, ban bump stocks, give first responders more power to seize weapons from those deemed a threat, and one more thing. I guess they've been listening to me a lot more because unexpectedly they pass concealed carry for some very special teachers that have a great ability with weapons and with guns. And they passed that. It was somewhat surprising to people because they didn't go in thinking about that, but I guess they liked what I said. I guess. Although Florida Governor Rick Scott is opposed to arming teachers and has yet to sign the bill. On the federal level, there was a small ray of hope today. A bipartisan bill sponsored by Connecticut Democrat Richard Blumenthal and South Carolina Republican Lindsey Graham. It's a so-called red flag proposal, which would let police and family petition a court to temporarily take away a person's guns if they're deemed an imminent threat. This is not about losing your gun rights easily. This is about intervening at a time it would matter. A few states like Connecticut already have laws like this, although Massachusetts is not one of them. So after Florida, is there a round two? Joining me are Andrea Campbell. She's the president of the Boston City Council. It's good to see you. you too, Jim. Jennifer Nassour is former chair of the Massachusetts Republican Party and founder of Conservative Women for a Better Future. Chuck Todd was on a radio show today, and he said to Mardrigan, he thinks Tallahassee, meaning the Florida law, can be a model for Washington. What can happen there can happen in D.C. Is that even remotely possible? I don't know. I mean, I, I think I, I come from this uh, with the context, of course, thinking about Massachusetts and how strong our laws are. But at the end of the day, what my constituents care about is what's happening in neighboring states, New Hampshire, Vermont. And so how That's do we... That's why you need federal laws, isn't it? No. State by state. I mean, it helps with gun fatalities, but it's not as good as having a federal uh, sort of common thing. No, that's right. But, you know, I think what's important to us on the council is just that. If D.C. isn't moving and isn't moving fast enough, we still have to, to get things done. And so we're thinking about what can we do at the local level to respond to these issues and, frankly, um, get things done quicker than D.C. I want to talk to you about uh, what might be done locally. But in terms of Washington, is Chuck Todd too optimistic? Is there any sign other than this red flag bill that Congress is ready to do anything at all on guns? You know, I, I think that they I think that they are. I think that they can. And I think that he's he's he, he's being optimi a little bit optimistic. But I think if you look at Florida and last week, they weren't going to do anything. Two weeks ago, they weren't going to do anything. And now we're here where they're raising the minimum age and they're, you know, banning bump stocks. So I, I think no that assault that weapons ban, though, which is what the students down there are the driving yes. force behind this. But one. I mean, baby steps, right? Rome wasn't built in a day. Yeah. So let's talk about local for a minute. I mentioned this red flag law, which I've talked about before in this show. Why wait for the federal government? Massachusetts is not one of the five states that has a law that basically said, as I said there, either a family member or a member of law enforcement can go to a court, they don't decide unilaterally, and a judge decides if that man or woman should have their weapons taken away because they're, quote, an extreme risk, I think is the term. Should we not have that here and have it fast? I think there's... A I tell my team all the time, you know, even if we're excellent, we can always do better and be better. And so these are issues, obviously, that have to come through the state house. Um, so I bring the concerns of the residents in my district, which is largely Dorchester, Mattapan, and I bring these concerns to the members of our Boston delegation and those in the state house to say, can we do more? Well, let me, um, let me, let me ask you about your district then. Yeah. Well, I asked the governor about this on our radio show today, and I, I, I don't want to say he didn't think it was necessary, but he said, Jim, you're missing something. We, the law that allows police chiefs to grant permits also allows them to take them away. I'm not familiar. He said there are circumstances. I'm not familiar with many circumstances where a police chief has gone in after having granted uh, mm -hmm. a, a gun permit, said, uh-uh, I'm taking it back. Are you? 
Not that I can think of, um, and I don't know, you know, obviously I, that's a question maybe for Commissioner Evans and, or some of the local captions to say, has there been an instance where some, you know, an, in, an individual who has, currently has uh, a gun is, shouldn't have that gun. Is there um, any reason so I don't we shouldn't know. just pass this red flag thing, even if it's redundant, even if Baker, Governor Baker is right, why not do it? I mean, what's the downside to giving a court that power? It's not saying a mother can do it or a cop can do it, a court could do it. So, I mean, in Massachusetts, we do have the strictest gun laws in the nation. So, I mean, I think that, you know, one thing is we, we are at the head of the pack in all of this that's been we going on. We don't have a red on. flag law. Well, we don't have a red flag law, but, I mean, I think that there, it, it's a possibility, and maybe the legislature should take it up, and, and, and that's something for them. But last time I checked, the legislature are all the Democrats in Massachusetts. So maybe, well, there maybe is a Republican governor. You've heard of him, there right? Is, there is. Like, like, a, lot of times, a lot of times, you know, the way it works, it goes through the legislature and then lands I up with the governor. That, by the way. You know, it's it's unbelievable. Funny, civics 101. <laughs> Can we make an impossible transition, if you don't mind, to another major story of the day? The Stormy Daniels saga took another turn this week. For those of you living under a rock, this is the porn star. She has filed a lawsuit, claims she had sex with uh, Donald Trump, and she now claims the agreement to keep her quiet about her affair with Trump was invalid because he never signed it. Well, CNN is reporting the president is mad at his press secretary, Sarah Sanders, because of this comment at yesterday's news briefing. Uh, this case has already been, been won in arbitration, and anything beyond that, I would refer you to the president's out, outside counsel. You know, if Barack Obama had a porn star accusing him of all this, $130,000 hush money, there would be hearings in every single committee in Congress. There's crickets. Should the Republicans not be holding hearings into their president's behavior and this payoff of this woman, by the way, a month before the election in 2016? So he was not president and not elected at the time. The election that, was a month away. Uh, yes. And he but, wanted to make sure she wasn't heard from. And, and, the contra and if Michael Cohen, the lawyer, paid $130,000, it's probably an illegal campaign contribution. So putting all that aside... That would be up to Michael Cohen. That would actually be on him for the FEC to go check out what he has done. However, as far as what the president did, he did not think that he was going to win that election. No one thought he was going to win that election. And so he didn't actually do anything while he was president. You know, for for her claims, I mean, I guess it's a legal issue. Their names were not, actually did not appear as because their legal names. And, and, and it was, while he and it was, was president brokered, yesterday, his lawyer went and got a restraining order and against her. And it was her. a deal brokered by someone else. It wasn't brokered by his him. His lawyer. It was his lawyer. But, I mean, I, you know, I'm a lawyer. If I, I you yeah, know. Yeah, if you I go on behalf of a client and under I a phony name. And then name. should be disbarred as a result. I mean, it's on Michael Cohen. It's not on the president. Okay, let's uh, forget this then. It's International <laughs> Women's Day. Here's what that same president had to say on International Women's Day. Here he is. We also recognize that today is International Women's Day, and we're proud in all of the measures we've taken economically to empower women, especially in the workplace. You see what's happened. And I'm very pleased to announce that the unemployment rate for women in our workforce is at an 18-year low. You know, Counselor, I think it's fair to say that women, uh, white women in particular, and women without a college degree were key to this president being elected. Here's some numbers. 53% of white women voted for Donald uh, Trump. Now only 42% approved. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 60% of women without a college degree w w voted for him. They were the key to his election. Are women the key to unseating the Republicans in the midterm elections eight months from now? First of all, I just have to start with the fact that he was reading off of a piece of paper on International Women's Day, and have, you have to read to describe so really from the, the compliments <laughs> of women in this country. Um, I find that so disturbing. And, and frankly, back to your point about this idea that you know Stormy Daniels uh, and other allegations against the president happened when he wasn't in office. You know, as public servants, we should be held to a higher standard. Um, so whether it's in office or out of office, it doesn't matter. But are women um, going so we have to rebel? Well, they already are. And so I think we have to just, you know, raise our standards. But that being said, on International Women's Day, I'm not talking about Donald Trump. You know, I'm talking about the Boston City Council, six women that we have on the council, which is f fantastic. Me being the first African-American city council president, which is also fantastic. And all the incredible accomplishments of my colleagues and those on the ground doing the work every single day. I brought my six-month-old six here today. We you know, the mothers, you know, um, that's what I choose to focus on. And I, 
I'm pushing back on you and some others to say, let's talk not about Donald Trump on this special day. It's one day. Can we spend it talking about awesome women? And remember, women should be celebrated every day, just like Black History Month should not just be in February. Well, let me tell you, I'm far too embarrassed to ask another question. <laughs> Counselor, it is great to see you. Thank Happy you. International Women's Thank Day. You. And to you, Jennifer. Good to see you, Jim. It's great to see you both. Thanks so much for your time.